table is familiar with this. This isn't one of our more abstruse and obscure topics on economic policy. This is, uh, and I'm, I'm going to let them also frame the issue too. I know that's important. But DACA, as you all know, was deferred action on uh, what are the childhood arrivals, uh, which was a policy put in place through executive order during the Obama administration and which President Trump recently tried to repeal without much success thanks to a district court judge in, was it San Francisco? Um, so Professors Goldstein and Blackman will be discussing the merits of that decision and maybe the memo as well. So a round of applause, uh, Professor Goldstein. Let's start up. Over there, no, that, my back's not to you. Speak from the. Yeah. It, you know, it's up to you. You could. Uh, you. you have a podium. You want to use the podium? podium? I'll sit over here, so I'm not. My back's not to you. Am I too far? I can move the podium a little closer. Is that all right? Yeah. If you want to sit here, you can. No, that's fine. I'll sit over here. It's fine. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for for being here, and, and thanks, Will, for inviting me. Um, uh, I think we all invited, it was just a week ago, right? That, or was it two, how long ago? Yeah, I think it was at least three weeks ago. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> that's, anyway, I got invited, what felt like at the last minute. It's not a subject that I know deeply, um, but I, uh, I'll i do my best. Um, and since I was appointed to represent, <laughs> uh, in this case, the side of the challengers, I'll do my best to present that side, although I'm not sure that I agree with everything that I'll be saying today, but as a lawyer, my, my job is to zealously advocate on behalf of this point of view, and I'll do the best I can. So, uh, our subject is about the rescission of DACA, but first I'll need to give you some background to make sure that everybody understands what we're talking about. So DACA, that is the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, was adopted in 2012 uh, by DHS, and what it does is postpone deportation of certain undocumented immigrants, that is, immigrants who are brought to the United States as children, and it gives them work permits, or at least, and allows them to get social security numbers and pay taxes. But it applies only to certain kinds of immigrants, that is, it applies only to people who meet certain criteria. The applicants have to have been brought into the United States before they were 16, they have to have resided continuously in the United States for five or more years, they have to have be enrolled in uh, school or a graduate of high school, they must not have committed a felony or any serious misdemeanor or pose any threat to national security. They have to submit an application to DHS. They, the uh, DHS reviews each application separately. They have to pass a background check and provide support for their application. Uh, a few common misconceptions that I want to clear up about DACA, about what it does and doesn't do, because this is important. It does not prohibit DHS from deporting anyone. That is the terms of DACA on it, the, the face of the policy, which I should mention were issued through executive order. Uh, the terms of DACA declare that it confers no substantive rights and can be modified, superseded, or rescinded without notice. So, and also, it does not grant lawful status to anyone. Um, that is, it doesn't change the status of someone who's in the country without uh, documentation. They still are someone who's in the country without documentation. So it provides no defense to removal. People who are DACA recipients could still be removed, and they can't say, but wait, I have, I'm, uh, I'm on the DACA list. I've been approved for DACA. It provides no legal right in that way at all. It, instead, it amounts to essentially an unenforceable commitment by the government not to deport people who qualify in order to get them to come out of the shell. But it's an unenforceable commitment. Um, and in fact, even in the absence of DACA, it's unlikely that any administration would target this group who are often referred to as dreamers because they have long been a low priority category for deportation. But the main benefit of DACA um, for uh, dreamers who sign up for DACA is that they get work authorization. That is uh, based on the recognition that they're going, if they're going to be in the country, um, it's better for them to work above board, pay taxes, than requiring them to work in the black market or rely on employers who violate the rules, which might result in more crime and participation in the illegal economy. So it's, if we have a category of people who are not going to be deported, and the government has long had the policy long before DACA, that they will not deport people who came into the country as children and have not, and have not committed any crimes, um, it's better for them to work above board. That's the basis of the policy. Um, 
Now, one other thing uh, to keep in mind, another little piece of background that I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on um, uh, that's helpful to understand the litigation about DACA is another program which goes by the unfortunate uh, acronym of DAPA. Uh, unfortunate because they're so easy to uh, confuse, but DAPA uh, is another work authorization program for another group of low priority undocumented immigrants which are parents of American citizens and parents of people who have lawful permanent residence. That is, there are many undocumented immigrants whose children are citizens by virtue of being born here, um, or their, their children become lawful permanent residents. Uh, and so DHS has like, long identified this group as another group that has low priority for deportation. And so in 2014, oh, and the reason why is because they don't want to deport the parents of minor children um, who are citizens and deprive citizens of their parents. So as long as uh, uh, these, this category, uh, again, if they have not committed any felonies or major misdemeanors or pose a threat uh, to national security, DHS announced that people in that category should, would also be granted deferred status and uh, be allowed to uh, receive work authorization. Now, DAPA was challenged by 26 attorney generals who brought suit to say that it was invalid, and the district court in uh, the South District of Texas um, granted a preliminary injunction against DAPA. The Fifth Circuit affirmed that decision, and then the Supreme Court heard the case and divided four to four. So the, uh, the ruling that DAPA was invalid was affirmed without a decision by the Supreme Court, without any uh, finding precedent. All right. So that's back a little, well, so then what happened is in 2017, uh, Secretary, who, uh, John Kelly, who was then the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, rescinded DAPA. That same month, 10 of the Attorney Generals, who had been suing to challenge DAPA, told uh, Attorney General Sessions that they would bring suit to challenge the validity of DACA unless DHS rescinded um, and on September 4th, the day before the deadline given by these attorney generals, Jeff Sessions sent a letter to then acting Secretary of DHS, Elaine Duke, and gave her his legal opinion that DACA had been created without proper statutory authorization. That is, uh, he cited the fact that Congress had repeatedly rejected proposed legislation that would have accomplished a similar result, and that therefore the DACA program uh, was an unconstitutional exercise of authority by the executive branch. Um, the AG also referenced the preliminary injunction against DAPA and said that because the DACA policy has the same legal defects as DAPA, uh, it's likely that DACA will also be found to be unconstitutional. The next day, DHS rescinded uh, the only ground for the rescission was the legal determination by the Attorney General. That is the only basis for rescinding DACA, DACA was that AG Sessions said that DACA was uh, beyond the uh, authority of uh, DHS. All right, so now we come to the issue for today. Was the rescission valid? Now, the plaintiffs in the case of asserted a variety of grounds for, for challenging the rescission of, of DACA. The challenges in the case include the University of California, who says that their students uh, uh, are harmed by it, and others. Uh, their standing, I don't especially uh, think is interesting to talk about, but the grounds why they say the rescission is invalid include things like it was issued without notice and comment rulemaking under the Administrative Procedures Act, that the rescission deprives DACA recipients of property without due process or with deprives them of liberty, that it violates equal protection, um, or that it violates principles of equitable estoppel. Now, personally, I find most of these grounds unpersuasive and are unlikely to uh, result in uh, a victory for the, uh, for the challengers. But one of the grounds that the challengers bring, I think is really worth considering. And that's this. They argue that the rescission is arbitrary, capricious, or otherwise not in accordance with law under the Administrative Procedures Act. Now, as a general matter, administrative agencies have power to 
revoke prior policies. When a new administration comes into power, they have the authority to change the policies that have been put in place by the administration before. Um, and these agency decisions to change uh, a policy, to revoke a policy, to institute a new policy, are reviewed under the APA based on the grounds that they were issued. Here, the only ground for rescinding DACA is the assertion that DACA was issued without legal authority. DHS didn't say that DACA was adopted for bad policy reasons, that it hurts the economy, that it gives wrong incentives to enter the country. There was nothing like that. The only ground for rescinding DACA was that it was illegal, that DHS lacked authority to do that. So if that's right, or let me say, if that's wrong, if it's incorrect, the DACA is unlawful, then the decision to re rescind it is arbitrary. That is, if it was the rescission was based on a legally erroneous principle, then the rescission is arbitrary. And the principle comes up in many cases. If you consider like Massachusetts versus EPA, the case about EPA's regulation of greenhouse gases, EPA said we can't regulate that because we don't have any authority to regulate it. And that decision was reviewed under the APA, and the court said, well, actually, you do have authority to regulate greenhouse gases, and so your decision to decline to, to regulate these, these pollutants is arbitrary or not in accordance with law. The same thing is true here. DHS has authority to create DACA, so it, its decision to revoke it is arbitrary because it was based on the erroneous view that it lacked power to do so. Now, so to, so to get into that, we have to look at what DHS's authority was in the first place for issuing DACA. So let's look at that. So DHS, uh, the, the authority to regulate immigration is given to Congress through its enumerated power over uh, naturalization. The president may have some independent power pursuant to his authority over foreign affairs, but Congress has authority to regulate immigration under the naturalization clause. Congress has delegated that authority to the Secretary of Homeland Security through a variety of statutes. In particular, um, uh, it has given DHS authority to defer action for otherwise deportable immigrants. What, what the statute says is the Secretary of uh, Homeland Security has power to, quote, establish national immigration enforcement policies and priorities. So DHS has prosecutorial discretion to decide which persons who are here unlawfully uh, to remove, that is, who to deport and who not to deport. You can't deport them all. It doesn't have the the resources. Congress has never given DHS the resources to remove all undocumented persons. So it has to decide the priorities about who it's going to remove. And for decades, DHS and its, pri its predecessors have prioritized deporting undocumented immigrants who commit felonies, um, especially those who pose threats of violence. These are the high priority immigrants who get deported. In contrast, the people who are, are the recipients of DACA are low priority immigrants, and for years, DHS has said, we, we do not consider this group to be a high priority, so uh, we, will, we do not generally deport people in that group, that is, people who came here as children and who have committed no crimes uh, and can show continuous presence. Um, all the DACA does, well, not all the DACA, but the main thing that DACA does is to institutionalize this long-standing policy of, of deferring deportation for those who are low priority. Um, DHS said in its memo that it ensures that enforcement resources are not expended on low priority cases. Now, the other thing that DACA does, in addition to institutionalizing the, uh, the low priority status of DREAMers, is it gives them uh, work authorization. Now that too, DHS has statutory authority to do. Congress expressly gave DHS authority to grant work authorization. The Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986 prohibits anyone from hiring an unauthorized alien. Now that term, unauthorized alien, is defined in the statute, that is Congress defined it, as someone who's not lawfully admitted, nor, quote, authorized to be employed by this chapter or the Attorney General. It, the authority of the Attorney General has since been transferred to DHS. So in other words, Congress has given DHS the authority to authorize people to work who otherwise are not lawfully in the country. Um, 1987, under President Reagan, um, DHS, its predecessor, uh, issued regulations to, to provide work authorization for those in a deferred status, that is people who are not being deported, despite the fact that they were here unlawfully, um, for any alien uh, uh, who can show that uh, uh, an economic necessity to work. 
So that is people who are in a deferred status, which is a long-standing status that Congress has recognized in various statutes, uh, can be given uh, authorization to work by DHS. So the two key elements of DACA are, are given to DHS by statute, the authority to decide who to, who to deport and who to prioritize uh, deporting, um, and to authorize those who it's, who it's deferring deportation to, to work. Um, so, so DHS has under the statute authority to do exactly what DACA does. Now the challengers to DAPA and then to DACA say, uh, they make a number of claims about you know, why this is invalid. Um, first they say, well, it's, it's invalid to create a national program based on prosecutorial discretion. That is, they say it's one thing to use the discretion not to deport this person or that person. But it's another thing to use the this discretion to decide uh, to create non-enforcement for a large class, you know, rather than on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, still, I, it, I don't find this argument especially powerful because DHS has authority under the statute to set deportation policies, and I can't see what the, the nature of the objection to putting that policy uh, into writing so that everyone knows exactly what they are. So that it, uh, instead of saying, we're just gonna decide each person one case at a time, it DACA announces, here are our priorities for deportation, people who meet these qualifications, we're not going to deport unless we have some reason to. Um, uh, in any event, DACA establishes a case-by-case -case determination for who qualifies for the program. Everybody has to apply and show that they meet the qualifications, that they've been continuously in the country for five years, that they don't, that they've committed no felonies, et cetera. So there's still a case-by-case -case determination for whether you meet the criteria for not being deported. Um, the, other, um, the other argument that's asserted at, at, by Attorney General Sessions is that uh, DHS is trying to do an end run around Congress. Um, what, what Sessions says is Congress had considered uh, the DREAM Act and rejected it, um, and here DHS is trying to do the same thing. So if Congress decided not to give uh, Homeland Security the power to uh, uh, do what DHS is doing, DHS is doing it anyway as an end runner on Congress. But now this uh, assertion is false on, for several different reasons. First of all, the DREAM Act, which Congress never rejected, it passed the House, uh, it, it got a majority in the Senate, but didn't get a filibuster, didn't, you know, couldn't get to 60 votes for closure, wasn't rejected by, the, by anybody. Um, but, even, but even so, the DREAM Act did a lot of things that DACA doesn't. It would give legal status to people who qualify for that and, and a pathway to citizenship. So it would have given you know, much more expansive rights than DACA does. Um, so the fact that Congress give, considered and decided not to give very expansive rights to DREAMers doesn't say anything about whether DHS has current power uh, under the statutes to grant work authorization and deferred action to those who are in who are qualified for DACA. That is, that Congress's decision not to pass the DREAM Act doesn't speak to what power DHS already has. So it, it's just not a responsive argument. So, um, so the, these two arguments for the invalidity of DACA strike me as uh, unpersuasive. Now, one thing I want to note before I turn, turn it over to uh, to Josh is I do want to say this. My argument isn't to say that DHS lacks the power to rescind DACA. That is, the argument that I'm making is that their decision, the rescission of DACA was unlawful, that it was arbitrary, because it was based on an erroneous legal premise. So if I'm right about that, then the rescission was unlawful. But it doesn't mean that DHS can't still rescind DACA. The DACA itself is not required by the Constitution or the statute. They didn't have to create a program of deferred action and work authorization. Um, they had prosecutorial discretion and discretion under the statutes uh, to do that. So DHS has discretion to create DACA. It also has discretion to revoke it. But it can only revoke or rescind DACA for a non-arbitrary reason. So if DHS wants to revoke DACA, it can. But it can't do it on this furious ground that it lacks authority to do so. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to Josh, and, and I think I have a few minutes to rebut. Uh, yeah. I, I would like to see things that you do know a lot of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's, um, modesty is a trait of Professor Goldstein's, which his students are very, very fortunate. 
thank you so much for hosting Rhode Island, my first time in Providence, and uh, to my good friend, Professor Goldstein, for uh, giving a spirited opening. Um, on January 20th, 2017, the executive power peacefully transitioned from President Obama to President Trump. At least one judge in San Francisco did not get the memo. Uh, judge William Alsop ordered the Trump administration to keep its predecessor's deferred action policy, DACA, in place. This remarkable 49-page order has all the aesthetics of a judicial, a judicial decision, but as its heart is an act of punditry. Judge Alsop paints a picture of a divided White House wherein, quote, the chief executive publicly favors the very program his administration has ended. Citing a presidential tweet, that's what judges do now, the court suggests that DACA's rescission was contrived to give the administration a bargaining chip to demand funding for a border wall in exchange for reviving DACA. These talking points could have been plagiarized from MSNBC. Now, such rhetoric in a judicial decision would have been unthinkable barely a year ago, but now it passes for the new normal. Once again, the, the judiciary has attempted to shackle President Trump from making his own judgments about how to exercise his own power. Now, the Supreme Court has reversed Judge Alsop once before, and it'll do so again. Now, I'm grateful that Professor Goldstein introduced DACA, so I don't have to. But let me start at this point. The Obama administration, by its best light, determined that DACA and DAPA, that DACA and DAPA were lawful. The Trump administration has reached the opposite conclusion and moved to rescind both policies. Trump was guided by a Fifth Circuit decision that split two to one. He was guided by a Supreme Court decision that split four to four, which is not an opinion on the merits. In a normal world, the Trump administration's decision would have been end of the matter. But in the bizarre world we find ourselves, a federal judge has informed Trump that he must now keep DACA in effect. Judge Alsa based his decision on the fact that the executive branch offered only a pithy conclusion that the agency has exceeded its statutory and constitutional authority, and this was a mistake of law. Specifically, the court ruled the Trump administration's decision was, quote, arbitrary, capricious, and abuse of discretion, or not otherwise in accordance with law. Now, reading this serious charge, one would suspect that President Trump scrawled his legal defense in the back of a cocktail napkin with a Sharpie. Hardly. In October 2017, Attorney General Sessions determined that DACA was implemented without proper statutory authority and was an open-ended circumvention of the immigration laws. Now, not only was this policy a violation of the INA, the Immigration Nationality Act, but it was also, quote, an unconstitutional exercise of authority by the executive branch. Sessions reaffirmed his duty to defend the Constitution and to faithfully execute the laws passed by Congress. Sessions added, that proper enforcement of immigration laws is, as President Trump consistently said, critical to the national interest and the restoration of the rule of law in our country. So this wasn't only a legal defense, it was policy in there, I think, as well. Now, Sessions' analysis was premised on a decision of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which two years earlier ruled that DAPA was unlawful. Now, I wrote at the time that in halting DAPA, the Fifth Circuit assumed the program we implemented in a very similar way as DACA was a blanket measure akin to legislation, not case-by-case -case exercise of prosecutorial discretion. The Fifth Circuit's decision strongly suggested that DACA, which was not being challenged, was illegal as well. As even Judge Alsop was forced to concede, at least some of the Fifth Circuit's reasoning for holding DACA, I'm sorry, DAPA illegal would apply to DACA. Now indeed, DACA's legality was on even shakier footing than DAPA's. Why? Because dreamers did not need to have any familial relationship with an American citizen to receive lawful presence. This is what's today called chain migration. It used to be called family reunification. But unlike DAPA, DACA cannot be justified as a family reunification measure, but could only be defended on what the Obama administration called humanitarian concerns. Now, this is no doubt a legitimate policy argument, but it's not binding on the Trump administration. The Fifth Circuit's ruling was appealed to the Supreme Court. As Professor Goldstein said, they split four to four after Justice Scalia's passing. Now, had Justice Scalia been on the bench, I'm willing to bet that Texas would have prevailed, and I think Gorsuch would vote in a similar fashion. Now, in a normal world, it would be entirely rational for the Attorney General to wind down DACA, which was the model for DAPA, based on a ruling against DAPA by a federal court of appeals, combined with signals from the Supreme Court. Not so for Judge Alsop who insisted that the DAPA litigation was not a death knell for DACA.
For example, he writes the difference between 4.3 million DAPA recipients and 700,000 DACA recipients. Yes, the numbers are different, but so what? Breaking the law of 700,000 people is still illegal. Judge Alsop next argues that DAPA and DACA are different because citizen children can petition for citizenship for their parents, whereas the Dreamers had no pathway to lawful presence. That argument actually undermines DACA's legality, right? Why? Congress has viewed DAPA beneficiaries more favorably as a class because they at least have the prospect of becoming citizens down the road. Not so for the Dreamers, who have no path to citizenship. Finally, Judge Alsop insists that the Trump administration can cure any problems with DACA by simply insisting on an exercise of discretion. But the crux of DACA is that there is no meaningful discretion. It operates as a rubber stamp. And it's not for federal judges to instruct the president how to exercise his discretion. In any event, these contrived quibbles are relevant. And this, I think, is where Professor Goldstein and I disagree the most. President Trump does not need to persuade every single federal judge about DACA's legality before halting it. Judge Alsop, who continues a disturbing trend, failed to afford the deference due to a coordinate branch of government in making legal determinations. Trump has the electoral mandate to reverse the decisions of his predecessor and the constitutional obligation to assess the constitutionality of his actions. The judgment here, premise on decision of the Fifth Circuit, provides more than enough basis to rescind DACA. Moreover, the president's determinations that an exercise of his own power was unconstitutional. This is not just a statute. He said it was unconstitutional, warrants the court's solicitude. That is a discretion for the president to make in consultation with his advisors, and one that should not be disturbed lightly by a federal court. Judge Alsop completely ignored this constitutional issue, completely didn't mention it, fo focusing exclusively on the statutory question. Indeed, I am unable to think of any decision where a court has ordered a president to exercise discretion he has deemed to be unconstitutional. Now, the government has already announced it will appeal. It's taken the unorthodox step of going right to the Supreme Court. They've petitioned for certiorari before judgment. This has only happened a handful of times. I've counted three grants in the last decade. One of them was Youngstown, she two company, Dames and Morby Regan, USB Nixon. These are big, big cases. But the Supreme Court has already signaled its dissatisfaction with Judge Alsop. Um, last fall, Judge Alsop ordered the Trump administration to turn over internal White House documents concerning why DAC was canceled. The government filed an emergency appeal to the Supreme Court, urging the justices to shield the executive branch documents from judicial scrutiny. Then the case got weirder. In what the New York Times described as a, quote, unusual move, Judge Alsop filed his own brief have you heard of judges following their own briefs in their cases? This is, he filed his own brief in which he told the justices that the Trump administration leaves the court with an incorrect impression. Judges can file briefs, who knows? I wasn't able to find any Supreme Court rule that permits a judge to file a brief in his own appeal. Anyway, his strange advocacy didn't impress the justices. Uh, less than a month later, with that reported dissent, the Supreme Court rebuffed Judge Alsop's brief and his order. Not that it mattered, because he was still able to halt the president's actions based on the limited record before him. Now, this now common fait accompli where judges demand access to internal deliberative documents and when rebuffed, rule against the president anyway, evinces a feeling of a show trial. It is no wonder the Supreme Court took the unusual step of intervening in a discovery dispute. Now, I want to mention a few points in response to Professor uh, 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 Goldstein's argument. Um, the argument says, the only basis on which Trump and Sessions put in the letter to rescind it was legal, that it was a statutory violation and constitutional violation. I don't know if that's entirely true because there's some stuff about the rule of law and promoting you know, values, but I'll, I'll just assume that point, right? Why didn't Trump or in Sessions say, we're going to wind this down because we think it's a bad policy, right? That we think it's um, you know, not a good use of resources? Um, because that's probably arbitrary as well. Right? The entire notion of DACA is utilizing resources in an effective manner. To rescind DACA would have to increase the amount of immigration resources, more deportations, right? more enforcement actions. Under the cases like uh, um, the Encino motor car case, I think the courts could actually strike it down, saying this is not a valid reason, right? This is not the reason. You're not saving resources. You're actually increasing resources. And here comes the coup de grace. The real reason you're acting is animus. Oh, yes, 
animus. This is our favorite word, right, from Justice Kennedy. We all know President Trump says a lot of really dumb and stupid and racist things. He does it on a frequently, you know, regular basis, so much so I think we're, we're numb to it at this point. But the attorneys general in California, New York, and otherwise, have charged that President Trump's rescission of DACA violates the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. Why? Because it's motiva motivated by animus. Romer V. Evans, for example, Professor Goldstein taught you that case, right? That actions motivated by animus have to be enjoined. And I'm not making this up. Judge Alsop issued a second opinion on this exact point. And he said, there is a plausible inference that President Trump's racial animus towards Mexicans and Latinos was a motivating factor in the decision to end DACA. Now, what are these evidence? For example, when he threw Jorge Ramos out of an event, when Trump said um, uh, Mexico sends us their murderers and rapists, when he says we have to build a wall, uh, you know, all, you, can, you can find the litany of Trump statements about Hispanics and Latinos. I don't need to repeat them for you. But the court looked at these statements that this creates a plausible inference of animus. Okay? To reach its conclusion, the court relied exclusively on statements from Trump from before the inauguration, right? Not like current presidential tweets, pre-presidential tweets. Judge Alsop suggested that clear-cut indications of racial prejudice on the campaign trail should not be forgotten altogether. Alsop looked to those statements to dismiss the Attorney General's letter as a contrived excuse. In other words, by looking to this racial animus, the court said, all this arbitrary doesn't matter. This is contrived. It's an excuse. In other words, Sessions' conclusion about DACA's legality is a mere pretext, a sham, to cover up Trump's hostility towards Latinos. This analysis goes even further than a new normal of federal jurisprudence, as illustrated by litigation concerning the travel ban. At least in those cases, Trump's statements have to do with the travel ban. But here, none of the statements cited about Jorge Ramos and building a wall have anything to do with DACA. Alsop dismissed the concerns, admitting that even though these statements were not about the rescission of DACA, quote, they still have relevance to show racial animus against people south of our border. Now, this is a very, very dangerous line of argument. If we take the position that Trump is permanently disabled as a matter of due process of law, from doing something that's impact Hispanics and Latinos, his entire foreign policy becomes crippled. And do I need to mention the S-hole comment? Right, I can't say this in a university club, right? Africa as well, right? How many countries has he insulted? How many nations has he insulted? How many groups has he insulted? Everyone, I mean, basically everyone can find a tweet. There's a tweet for everything, right? If this line of reasoning is true, and Trump's actions and his idiotic tweets now disable him from, from being president, we basically had a coup, right? We basically had a removal of a president without the benefit of an impeachment trial, right? If he can't do this, if his actions that have a disproportionate impact on Mexico, on, on, on Guatemala, whatever country you can think of, Haiti, courts can stop and due process, this presidency is over. And this is a point I've been making since the very beginning. This is the danger when courts start reading in presidential statements when it affects foreign policy. There's a very serious concern because it disables the president, allows some judge to issue a nationwide universal injunction, global injunction, about the latest action. Now, this is why I've come to the conclusion that Sessions put all of his eggs in the legal and constitutional basket. This is what Professor Goldstein was asking. Why did Sessions do it this way? I think this is the reason. No one told me. No one, I don't have any friends on the inside. I don't know. But I think this is the reason why. Keeping this about law avoids opening up the door to policy. Because once you open the door to policy, you bring in the tweets, right? You bring in Jorge Ramos, right? You bring in murderers and rapists, right? You invite yourself by saying, what's the policy? I think they want to keep this as neat and clean as possible, right? Um, that's why I think Sessions did it the way he did. Now, I don't know if I agree with this, but the AG doesn't want to go down the road of opening the door to character evidence, right? Deposing the president to see what is animus is towards Hispanics. I don't know the answer. Now, as Attorney General, though, right, the president, I'm sorry, he has a duty to defend the Constitution. And this is a point that I don't think Alsop engaged with nearly enough, right? This is Article 2. The Attorney General's conclusion that DACA is unconstitutional is a manifestation of the president's own determination about his oath of office. Now, it's rare, very rare, the presidents disclaim their own authority. Trump through Sessions have reversed the one-way ratchet in that he's saying, I am giving up power that my predecessor grandmas. This is fairly rare. Um, and unlike in a the APA, I'm sorry, the Mass for EPA case, 
you at least have the benefit of a court decision. So I think where this case ultimately comes down to, and we're, I think we're, we're actually pretty close, does Massachusetts versus EPA stand for the proposition that you need to persuade every federal judge who rules on a case that your actions are not arbitrary and capricious, or can you rely on a court decision in making your choice that maybe is right, maybe is wrong, is that enough? I don't think the court's gonna hold that you need to persuade every single federal judge. In fact, I don't think the court's can even reach legality of DACA at all. I think the opinion, which we'll probably issue this term, will say, uh, we don't need to decide if DACA is legal because the, the governor, sorry, the AG relied reasonably on the Fifth Circuit's decision, and that's a non-arbitrary reason. I think reading Mass EPA beyond that, I think, goes too far. Uh, I'm, a, I'm not a fan of the Chevron doctrine, right? I don't want our deference. But the sort of uh, uh, hostility with which you read the, set, the AG's action, this is just a pretext, this, this is not real, that he's reading the decision, he's just making it up, that I don't think is going to stand. Now, uh, uh, let me fast forward to what I think is actually going to happen here. Um, there's a political angle and there's a legal angle, right? Trump is tweeting that every five minutes when it's not about the memo, it's about DACA, right? We're going to do a deal, we're going to do a deal. Does the Supreme Court take the case this year, right? If the Supreme Court takes the case this year and rules that DACA is illegal, then that, then that puts pressure on the political process because that means that the, the executive action has to stop and you need a legislative solution. Trump may actually like that, right? Trump may actually benefit from having this executive action at the table and will force the Democrats to deal. Or does the court say, um, maybe we can argue it now, we can hold it until next year, right? We don't have to decide it right away. Let the political process germinate. Um, my own two cents, whatever it's worth, which is worth what you paid for, um, is that the court takes it. Recall this split 4-4 last year. Um, for the justices, Went one way, four. we don't know exactly how they split. They don't tell us that, but split four to four. I think four plus Gorsuch wants to take this program down. They've determined that it's probably not a lawful exercise of executive power. And unlike the, uh, the Texas case where those questions on standing, which I think were legitimate questions here, I think the plaintiffs do have standing. Maybe not University of California. I think Jared's right about that. Some of the plaintiffs are a little bit fuzzy, but at least the, the actual individuals who stand to lose DACA, I think they, they're injured. Injury, in fact, I have no problem with that. So I think the court takes that case this year. There's another case pending the DACA that's also worth mentioning, the Arizona DREAM Act case. What happened? Arizona passed a law saying that DREAMers in their states can't get driver's licenses. The Ninth Circuit ruled that the state law is preempted by DACA. Wait a minute. Can executive action preempt state law? Well, maybe if it's authorized by the statute, we can argue about that. But what if DACA is illegal? Can an illegal executive action preempt state law? The answer is no. So the court may have to grapple with that issue also. Um, I want to note just on a, on a, on a general, uh, a, a broader uh, sense of is DACA lawful, is DAPA lawful? Um, I think these are close questions. I think the statutes Professor Goldstein mentioned are in the books. Uh, I don't think they can bear the weight that DAPA and DACA has put on them. There's a great opinion by Justice Scalia uh, in a case called, uh, 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 was it MCI versus, uh, oh God, MCI versus someone, I can't remember the other part, but it's a great Scalia opinion by MCI. Oh, and, oh you, you Sorry, stole my oh. line! You stole my line! Yes, <laughs> anyway. But Justice Scalia has this great line, says when Congress passes a statute that, that, you know, delegates authority, we presume Congress doesn't hide elephants in mouse holes, right? What does that mean? That when they wanted something very big and significant, Congress will signal, would we'll do something big. The statutes that, that Jared mentioned are fairly trivial. So, for example, the, the Reagan era statute you mentioned, if you look at the hearing of when that was enacted, uh, the Reagan Justice Department lawyer said, yeah, maybe a few thousand people might use this, right? It was passed on the understanding that it was very small incidental power. It had never been used on the scale of DAPA and DACA. The definitional statute, right? The power to set priorities, right? It's a statute, right? That cannot be used to circumvent entire provisions of the INA about removability and uh, a granting of benefits, right? This creates an entire new class of people who can be removed, but are outside the normal confines of the INA. So I've written briefs about this in the past. Actually, Peter Margulies, who is a, a Jared's colleague at Roger Williams, written briefs on this. The statute can't be used to justify um, these sorts of grand assertions of power. But look, even if I'm wrong, right? Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not an idiot. I'm not unreasonable, right? I am not arbitrary in thinking that this is the correct answer. So the bottom line here, and I'll, I'll wrap up and give back to Jared, is 
you cannot read the arbitrary and capricious standard to mean you have to persuade every single federal judge in the country. There are, what, 500 federal district court judges? You find one judge who disagrees, aha, another global injunction. That cannot be the standard. I think the AG made a decision, agree with it or not, it wasn't irrational, it wasn't arbitrary, capricious, it was not, not in accordance with law. Good enough, not. All right, I'll stop here, and I think we take some, uh, Jerry can respond, maybe do some questions and answers. Thank you so much. Keep my my rebuttal brief. Um, just a couple a couple of points. First, I want to say one thing that I think I do agree with Josh about, which is that if the court takes the case, that they will reverse. That is, I think that it's just making a prediction of how the case is likely to come out. I entirely agree with that. That is, I think that there are five votes on the court um, for the views that DAPA or DACA is, is unlawful. Um, uh, you know that I agree with. Um, a couple of things I, I just thought you know worth mentioning. He, he mentions that the attorney general said that it wasn't just that DACA was inconsistent with the statute, but it was also unconstitutional. That, that's true. I mean, that is, the Sessions letter mentions both statutory and constitutional grounds, but the two are actually identical. That is what made DACA unconstitutional, in, uh, according to attorney general Sessions, was that they lacked statutory authority for doing it, and therefore the agency was not uh, uh, was acting, you know, beyond any power that had been granted by Congress. That is, it was not uh, couldn't it couldn't be said to be taking care uh, to execute the law when there was no law. So that is, the lack of statutory authorization is what made it unconstitutional, according to the the attorney general. It's not a big point, but I don't. But it's just that the statutory and constitutional grants are not actually separate. Now the, the other, you know, the main point though, that um, that Josh makes is that um, if if the view that I was asserting before is right, that is that the AG um, can't rescind DACA um, unless unless he's right that that DHS lacks authority and that otherwise would mean that they have to persuade every federal judge of this fact. I don't think that that's exactly right. That is what what. I think that if an agency says we lack authority to do this thing and therefore we're taking away this program, this we're rescinding this existing program because we lack authority to do so, um, the court doesn't owe them deference on that legal view, right? That is, I mean, um, we do we think of deference to legal assertions under Chevron, right? An agency um, that asserts a legal position on in an, uh, in a formal way. Uh, typically, if you notice in common rulemaking, gets deference for its views when the statute is ambiguous, and as long as its view is reasonable. Now, maybe what, what Josh is saying is that the Attorney General should get deference on his legal view that DACA was illegal under Chevron. Uh, may, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure that Chevron applies in this context because. No, no it, right. Right, because there's no. The formal action is, is a letter from. The, the attorney general to the secretary, so it doesn't have the formality that that Chevron typically requires. So I don't think that the attorney general's legal view that DHS lacks authority is entitled to deference under Chevron. And typically, we don't think that the, the courts owe the administration deference on its legal views. As the courts, you know, it is emphatically the province and duty of the courts to say what the law is. That's what the court says in Marbury. Um, so. When the agency says we can't do this anymore because the statute doesn't allow us, well, a court can examine that question. It should examine that question. Maybe the right, maybe the wrong, but a court can decide whether the statutory arguments that we've rehearsed a little bit here are right. Does DHS have power to create DACA or not? I don't think the, the attorney general should get deference on that legal view. And um, this is not Chevron. Now, and, and uh, again, this is just like. Massachusetts versus EPA in this sense. That is when the agency said, we can't regulate greenhouse gases because we don't have power to. And the court says, well, actually, you do have power to. And it's similar reasoning. That is, why did the Bush administration say that they didn't have power to regulate greenhouse gases? Because it was an easier, more palatable grounds to put out there to the country. That is, instead of saying, we don't, we, we buy the, uh, you know, we don't buy climate uh, change science, or we agree with climate deniers, um, you know, that is which would have been politically uh, 
uh, hard, a very hard position for them to take. Instead, they said, we just don't have legal power to do that. And so when the court pushed back and said, you do have legal power to do that, then they have to face the question, it, are greenhouse gases pollutants under the Clean Air Act? This is similar. That it's, it's easier for, for DHS to say, we don't have power to do this. Um, even though we love dreamers, we want to take care of them. We think, doc, you know, we, we want to give them status. We want to give them work authorization, but we can't. That is, that's a much more palatable political position to take than to have to say, we think DACA is bad policy. That's what they weren't willing to say. That is, you know, the, the letter that says we, we can't do it is just an easier ground, a more politically palatable ground, than to say we don't think it's a good policy. Because, in fact, the president keeps saying how he wants to protect dreamers, and you know, he thinks, and I think that he thinks that it would be politically harmful to say uh, that it's bad policy. But if they're, they're going to make a decision based on the lack of legality, that they lack authority, well, that's a question that the courts can and should review. Either they have power to do it or they don't, but the, agency, but the court shouldn't defer to this question. And, so, and that's just what Judge Alsop did here. I disagree with you know several parts of his decision, and I do predict that the Supreme Court might not agree with him on the law. So I think that the that uh, docket is legally valid. You know, if, if I agree with, with Josh that it is a question that is a difficult one and courts could reasonably come out differently. So, Thank you. I'll give you one sentence. One sentence. Uh, the question is not whether Sessions is right or wrong on the, on the law. The question is whether his decision to revoke it is arbitrary and capricious. It's not whether DACA itself is legal, but his determination that DACA is illegal if that decision was arbitrary and capricious. So it's not about right or wrong. Okay? So now you have two seconds to hear about that one. <laughs> I think it's about that. Okay, sorry. Well, arbitrary and capricious or not in accordance with law. So okay. I would my focus on that. Kind of I'll leave it there. All right. Uh, we welcome questions from everyone. Please, you've been a wonderful audience. I have a question, which is... Please. And I think this gets to part of the DAC debate. I hope it does. Which is when you have so many laws and so many people uh, that are that are violating the laws, obviously prosecutorial discretion becomes a huge, mm -hmm. huge component of law enforcement's job. Uh, at what point does institutionalizing prose prosecutorial discretion become, I don't know what you would call it, uh, become a legislative act? And is that one of the grounds that they might declare DACA illegal on? Yeah, I mean, that is, you know, one way of capturing what the argument against DACA was that the Fifth Circuit adopted. You know, that is, that it, it's one thing to say you have discretion to decide on a case-by-case -case basis who to prosecute or who to deport, but it's another thing to codify that into a program and say, this category of people we're deciding not to deport and therefore we're going to give them status and they can, you know, apply for, you know, we're going to create new forms for them to fill out and they're going to be listed on the roll. That's different. The challengers said in DAPA, and the Fifth Circuit agreed, then a case by case decision for prosecutorial discretion. I think that the, that the distinction is not valid, although my colleague Peter Margulies agreed with, with Josh on this. And I, did, do you guys, you co authored an amicus brief to the Supreme Court. I disagreed yeah, with Peter. Peter, that, Peter is, a, is a dear friend. He's a fellow traveler. We wrote that amicus brief for the Southern District of Texas about 72 hours. Uh -huh. We wrote that real quick. Peter, we got better along the way. We wrote a district brief, we wrote a circuit brief, we wrote the Supreme Court brief, and I wrote the thing in the Harvard Law Review in this case, so I've, I'm dead talking about DAPA. Uh, but I will, I will answer the question like this. Um, the Constitution does add an additional criteria here, right? Is a president acting ultra virus? That's unconstitutional, right? There's a take care clause. Article 2 says the president shall take care the laws are faithfully executed. And we've argued even if he had the authority to issue DACA, the memo by itself, the manner in which it was implemented ran afoul of the take care clause because it amounted to a legislative act. That your entire category of people were giving 99 point, God, 97 percent grant rates, right? There was basically no discretion. And the government wasn't able to identify, identify a single case where DACA was denied for discretionary reason. Not one. They still couldn't do it to this day. Um, that's what Session was talking about, the Constitution, right? It's not just that he have the authority to issue the memo. It's a manner in which it's being implemented. So there is an additional um, element there that Peter and I bludgeoned to death with all these stupid briefs everywhere, uh, which I'm, 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 I'm glad we have to brush off. Uh, I just know Peter is a mensch, right? He's actually now on the other side. He thinks DACA is lawful, but DAPA is not. 
And he does this based on humanitarian concerns and other justification. So uh, you know you're, 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 you're a good scholar when you can look at the same issue with a slight twist and come out a different way. So uh, you guys are lucky you have Jared here, lucky you have Peter, you have a very good professoriate on your faculty. Okay. Oh, yes. When do you think police <laughs> or, you, know, are you go first. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I do find this a very difficult question. Um, I, I, I think I find it harder than, than Josh finds it. But I mean, I would say what I think, if this was a private defendant um, and who was being alleged to have acted based on an invidious purpose, you would look at any evidence that you had about what their animus was. You would look at you know what? You know you could introduce any evidence that they hold a grudge, hold animus against the category that the plaintiff is in, and then they might say that evidence either doesn't show animus, or even if I had animus, that's not why I made this decision. That is, in a private employer context, you know, all of these sort of evidence that came in in the travel ban case and that Judge Alsop here alludes to would come in. Now, I. I do think that it's different when it's the president. That is, when the president is acting to make decisions like you know, who can come into the country, who can stay in the country, who can be authorized, he's not a private employer. He's not a private person. He's the United States. He's the embodiment of the United States. And so to attribute to the United States as a, you know, as a government the private biases of one person, I think it's, some, it is, it's, not, a, you know, it's not exactly the same. Um, now I do. Now that said, I don't think that there are all found in every case either. That is, I don't. I wouldn't say that the private motivations of the president are irrelevant. In the, especially in the, in the in the travel ban case, I thought the tweets were quite relevant. That is, the president says, "I want to uh, uh, ban all Muslims from entering the country," and that you know, so I mean, that wasn't even a tweet. That was a you know, it was a speech. And then you know, he asked. Uh, 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 Rudy. Rudy Giuliani, thank you. You're you know, to put to put that policy, in, you know, how can we, you know, codify that policy? And then what they came up with was a travel ban. So it wasn't that far to go from I want to keep all Muslims out to the travel ban. And it seemed, you know, that you know his speech, the Giuliani statement that this was the attempt to codify it, were, was relevant. Um, when you get to DACA, the DACA rescission, I think, you know, the you know, Muslim rapist line uh, and build the wall are le are more remote, and so it's harder to infer, you know, that the policy made by the government, which you know is not technically made by the president at all, unlike the travel ban, which is issued by the president, it's just harder to connect. So it seems less relevant, and I think, it, um, partly for the reasons that Josh alludes to, it would it might well be a dangerous precedent to start inferring. In governmental intent for every act based on the private uh, revealed motives of uh, the, the president. That's the, that's my not fully formed view on that. <laughs> but I, uh, how much time do we have? Do we have a little time? Um, it depends on how many more questions. I'll answer your question briefly then. Yeah, I'll answer your question briefly. Five more minutes. The relevance of tweets is relevant is based on the standard of review. Um, I think in the context of foreign policy, one's a rational basis review. So in the travel ban case, there's no basis for extrajudicial statements. I think courts should even twist and turn to find ways to uphold it. There are very good ways to uphold it. So if the travel ban is irrelevant, um, the domestic case in DACA, I think, I think actually the tweets are fair game. I, 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 don't, I don't object to it. I think they're relevant because they're about murders and rapists and walls. They're, they're very attenuated, I think, as Jared alluded to a minute ago. Um, other cases are more different. I mean, you know, if he calls Haiti an S-hole country and we decide to s cut off funding to Haiti, can the court now enjoin that? Right? Can the court issue an injunction because we're, the president's animus? That is now disabling the president's foreign policy. I think that's where it becomes problematic. Um, yes, sir. If, you know, we saw in the State of the Union uh, a few days ago that, you know, President going to try to come to some kind of agreement with Congress on DACA. So would you expect that if a bill is passed by the House and Senate and signed by Trump that this <clears throat> issue may just become moot or would you expect the case continues or um so let me answer your question two ways, right? Even if a DACA bill is signed, there's no guarantee that everyone currently on DACA qualifies for it. 
So there might be still some small sliver of people who currently are receiving some benefit, but would stand to lose it under this new bill. Uh, under this new bill. So I actually don't think it resolves the case at all, which is why I don't think it'll be dumped as moot. Um, there's also the Arizona Dream Act case, which is still pending cert. I, the court might just deny that. But there are people who benefit from DACA who might not benefit from this new bill for whatever reason. So they'll find a plaintiff somewhere who can keep challenging it. I mean, it, it just depends on what the bill says. I mean, they might write the bill in a way that would capture all DACA recipients, and that would effectively move the case. I mean, if Congress is smart about it, they would they'll do that. But then, you, I mean, that's you know, that's a that's that's a that's a that's a that's a, that's a, friend, that's a friend of that's a friend of <laughs> If Congress is smart, I'm sorry. Alternatively, Congress could invalidate. They could. They could. They, that is, there's nothing in the Constitution that would stop them from saying you can't give. You can't give, uh, make this group uh, a low priority for deportation. You should prioritize them first. You should make sure that they don't get it. No one hires them. I mean, that yeah. would be no, I think there'd be no constitutional impediment to anything. I think it'd be bad policy. You have a question here? Yeah, it's kind of a segue into what I was wondering, which is how much of this problem, the genesis of the problem, has to do with Congress's perhaps uh, Excessive delegation, I guess. Oh, okay. Can I take that one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So now you're talking my language. Now you're talking my language. So I mean, this is a, this is a t-ball. So this is this is a big disagreement I have. Congress has enacted certain statutes concerning deferred action, right? They never actually said we're going to defer action. That's not a statute. It's been implied from other ancillary things like work authorization, etc. Um, when these statutes were passed, there's testimony before Congress. People from the Reagan administration said, we will use this on a very small basis, so a very small, thousands of people, right? Since then, various statutes have been repealed. There was something called uh, advanced parole, it's been repealed. So we have a very limited scope of where deferred action can be used. And I wrote a paper uh, uh, back in 2010 or, no, 14, whenever it was, wrote a paper saying, there's only been a couple instances where deferred action has been used under the current regime, right? What Reagan and Bush used, that was actually repealed. We don't have that anymore. So I'll give you an easy example. You're a foreign student in New Orleans, right? Hurricane Katrina hits. No more classes, right? Your school shut down. You don't have a credit load, so your student visa is now void. You are now illegally in the country and you're subject to removal. So President Bush said, aha, okay, what we're going to do is this. We're going to defer your deportation for a semester. If you can enroll at another university and get your credit load up, we'll reissue your student visa. That is how deferred action was used as a bridge where you had some status, or some other status waiting for the end of the rainbow, it's a bridge. I, I can demonstrate this is how deferred action has been used, always as a bridge. DACA and DAPA were never bridges, they were tunnels. They were trying to bypass through the fact they had nothing at the end of the tunnel. They had no, they had no prospect. Now, DAPA beneficiaries did chain migration, right? Family reunification. When the kid turns 21, they can petition for a visa. But DACA, the Dreamers, they had zero path to citizenship. They were barred from reentering the country, in fact, for maybe 10 years or so. So that is why this was not within Congress's delegation. I'm okay with saying Congress is a broad delegation. DACA went beyond it, right? This is what the Fifth Circuit discussed. In fact, the Fifth Circuit uses bridge metaphor. They didn't cite me, but they used my bridge metaphor in Judge Smith's opinion. It's fine. I'll take you know, no credit. It's fine. But that, that's the reason why this goes beyond it. Um, DAPA is actually on stronger ground because, again, in 21 years, kids can petition for a visa. That doesn't work with the Dreamers. Well, so, eventually they'll have kids. Yeah, yeah, so kids upon kids upon kids, and then their kids can, can petition 21 years hence. So, um, uh, yeah, but the kids will be natural born citizens, exactly right. But the point is, this is not consistent with how Congress enacted these statutes. Uh, I see people getting up and, and, and getting, getting ready to go, so maybe maybe one more question and we'll wrap up. Uh, yes, the back, sir. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think you mentioned uh, in a discussion about why uh, Sessions and Trump limited the scope of their repeal memo, I guess it is, uh, or state, mm -hmm. that they didn't, you didn't want to get into, or they didn't want to get into the, uh, the concept of, well, this can cost uh, more resources or yeah. other administrative reasons. Yeah. So my, my I guess confusion around that is uh, twofold. One, can they just sort of blanket say, you know, and for reasons of our no, administrative preference, I don't or that arbitrary? And then yeah. more broadly, can they say, you know, DHS is saying that really, it's it's the impact of this on other areas of the administration. So DHS might spend more money, but ten other agencies might save money. And does the court put itself in the 
in the position yes. of trying to weigh those dollars and, and, and public purposes? Yeah, the case is in Sino Motor Cars versus Navarro. It was up the court a couple of years ago. It's back up this year. The court can assess the dollars and cents there, and they can set it aside. Among and there is parts of the administration, even if they're not the parties to the, to the statutory authority? <sighs> I, again, again, I think under normal law, under normal law, you're right. But under Trump law, as we find ourselves in, courts start parsing this apart. But my, my point is, it opens up the door to a lot of discovery about what the actual purpose and policy implications are. And that's, I think, they want to stay far away from. Yeah, I mean, the, the decision is going to be reviewed on the, on the basis it was given. You know, and uh, I don't think, though, if, if they had said, you know, so all that they have to come up with is a, is a legally justifiable, non-arbitrary reason. And so all they had here was, we don't have authority, so we have to justify, you know, judge it on that. I do think, you know, that the reason why they that they gave that is because they didn't want to get into a policy discussion, not because because it would be arbitrary. I actually think that if they had said we think DACA is bad policy, that the court would, you know, would have no basis for saying that that, you know, is invalid. Um, they just didn't want to say that because that was not a politically palatable thing to say. And, and I think if they, had, even if they had said. We don't want to take it because of litigation. The litigation risk is too strong. That I think too would have been a non-arbitrary thing to say. That is, we think that there's a good chance that it, that this, that the decision is going to be struck down by by a court. But they didn't say that either. They just said we think we don't have legal authority to do it. And that you know we have to judge their you know their decision based on that you know that assertion. I just struggle with them having any limits on the stomach for political talent, right? I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's hard for me to say, look at them and say, they're making a decision because it's looking up out, right? That's like every day. I think they would scream no matter what they wrote. I think no matter what they wrote, the court was struck down on pretextual grounds. Okay. And this was the safest ground for them to do it. Tweet-based ground? Yeah. Government by blog post, right? That's what we have. Well, thank you both. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.